President uh-huh. Oaks has read my book, actually. But has he, he? He let me know. He sent me a couple of really nice letters. Wonderful people. But he did let me know. He goes, I did choose my topic before I saw your book. <laughs> No, no problem. It's God's content. It's not my content. <laughs> you know, it's good that we're all talking about it. You know, the more, awesome. the more the better. So, Make no mistake about it. You were born to be a true millennial. Welcome to True Millennial. My name is Parker Walbeck. I have with me today my wife, Alexis Walbeck, and we are joined by a very special guest today in Lily Anderson. Lily, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Great to be here. So Lily, correct me if I'm wrong in any of this, but you are currently a marriage and family counselor. Clinical social worker, so kind of individual marriage and family. Awesome. And she is a mother of eight, and she received her master's degree in social work, and she is the author of one of my wife and I's favorite books, which is Choosing Glory. We highly recommend this book. It was honestly perspective shifting for me when I first read it years ago. And I've come back to it several times as I've entered different stages of my life with being married and having kids, with parenting. Uh, It just helps you identify uh, where your standing is at with God in relation to the three realms or degrees of glory that we believe in in the church, which is the celestial, terrestrial, and telestial. And she does a great job at helping make it applicable in our daily lives and our different phases of life on how we can progress our way to the celestial realm and and essentially prepare for eternal life. And so, Lily, we just wanted to get you on. By the way, she has her own podcast, and I believe it's called Choosing Glory, correct? Yeah. I recycle titles that I like. (laughs) It's a wonderful title, yeah. yeah. And uh, so we're really grateful for the time she's taken, and she's basically going to give us a a Reader's Digest, a, a summary of what you can expect in this book, and just hopefully help people understand some of these principles that we've come to embody and that has helped our relationship, that has helped us become better parents. And and so, uh, yeah, so let's just start with the, the obvious first question, and that is, what is choosing glory? What does that mean exactly? Well, uh, interestingly, it seems to me that um, President Nelson, you know, within the last year or so, started, you know, gave a speech about thinking celestial. And I had a lot of people who were familiar with my work and with my book and the podcast ask me, gosh, has President Nelson read your book? And I said, I think we read the same book. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's right. It's more like that because yeah. this is scriptural. But, you know, my kids grew up hearing me say that the gospel is the best kept secret in the church. <laughs> and too often it is. We have this amazing yeah. feast before us, this great banquet table, and Sometimes we get stuck in just one section of the gospel, or Mm -hmm. uh, we understand some basics, but we don't know how to apply them better. So um, that's not a diss. I'm not trying to, you know, disrespect anybody, but there's so much more sometimes than we know. And it was, you know, Phil, forgive me, I'm going to take just a minute and say that I I gained a, a testimony of motherhood when I was in high school. Like all my all my talents were academic, and I thought I'd be a career lady. <laughs> but, but then I started praying about, it's a long story, but I started praying about some things, and I really got a testimony of motherhood. So I was grateful to be able to be a full-time mom for almost 20 years. And it was when I was a full-time mom that I actually discovered this principle or understood mm-hmm. it better and the application. So I really just want people to know that you don't have to be a you know, an academic, you don't have to be, um, you know, to be a gospel scholar, we just need to read and pray and study and let the spirit inform because that I was taught this as a mom at home. And it was when I was just reading through the DNC again, not for the first time that uh, section 88, I think it's verse 22 that talks about he that cannot abide the law of a celestial kingdom cannot abide a celestial glory. There I go. Mm -hmm. And so on and so forth for the other kingdoms. And it really hit me. And I thought, what does that mean? Like, what is yeah. celestial law? Am I living celestial? <laughs> what if I'm not? Yeah. I, I want to go to a celestial kingdom, but what's the difference between celestial law and terrestrial law and telestial law? And wh- yeah. Where would I fall? And of course, the, the scriptures don't give us like a written out formal chart, but all the information is there. Mm-hmm. So I started looking for it. And I started um, noticing when 
the scriptures talked about things that seemed to be very clear uh, in terms of celestial law and things that were more terrestrial, whatever. So anyway, I came up with my own chart. You know, it's in the book. I've been teaching this for years. Later on, a, a baseball bat revelation hit me over the head. And when I was praying about something different and told me to go back to school. And I didn't really want to. I loved being full-time at, with my kids. And, of course, God backs his play, and he made everything work out. My husband and children were extraordinary in their willingness to step up and do all kinds of things. And that did give me a chance to you know, share it with a broader audience, of course. But it's all his mm-hmm. material. This is all scripture. Yeah. So um, basically, what I saw was that the you know, in my language, I would say that the law of the telestial could be summarized as, what did I say, um, appetite Rule satisfaction and immediate man. gratification, yeah. meaning that the natural man is in charge. We do what we want, when we want, whatever the cost to others or even to ourselves. We we think that the immediate payoff is worth it. So we're being driven mm-hmm. by appetites. Our natural man is driving the bus, so to speak. And while there is that immediate payoff, And of course, human beings are driven by costs and payoffs. So that immediate payoff is very powerful. Satan's Mm -hmm. favorite tool, perhaps, is that immediate rush of pleasure, enjoyment, appetite, satisfaction. It just feels good, you know. But pleasure is super fleeting, and it needs to be fed again and again. And we see that with addictions, of course, at some extreme levels. But everything can be really habit-forming. I want that dopamine hit. I want that moment of pleasure. So I'm going to continue these behaviors, even though it may be locking me into my natural man. And the outcomes eventually, first for the people around us, and then for ourselves, are pain, violence, and destruction. Mm -hmm. It may not be physical, although it would certainly include that, but it's always emotional and spiritual pain, violence, and destruction. We ruin relationships. You know, as a counselor, I've seen so many marriages struggle. And I can absolutely attest that every marriage that fails or every marriage that struggles, it's because at least one of the partners, maybe both, but at least one is living telestially. Hmm. They might have a lot of terrestrial characteristics. Maybe they're really hardworking, successful at work or school, have good friends. You know, they could be able to control their natural man in certain arenas, but in the relationship, there are some things that are telestial, selfishness, in, you know, that covers a lot of territory. It's yeah. celestial, pride, laziness, you know, not being willing to, to work, um, impatience, yeah. unkindness, having a bad temper. Mm-hmm. You know, these are human, right? And right. every creature that's born on the planet has, has all those possibilities, seems, right? Yeah. And we see them in our kids, you know, yeah. if they don't get what they want, they cry. If uh, somebody takes their stuff, they want to grab it back, or maybe they grab it in the first place when somebody else is having it. And it's so natural. They're just little natural men and women that come to the earth and are stewardship. Mm -hmm. And it's our job to help them move out of the telestial realm into a more terrestrial space where they can feel the spirit. But that's the parenting. Let's jump to parenting right now. um, I mean, you mentioned that you want, you know, it's to focus on some marriage applications. And I'm here to tell you. If we can get out of the telestial realm, our marriages are so much better. They're Mm -hmm. happy. And when I was teaching at the Y for several years after my doctorate, I um, would tell the kids, you want to be happy? Marry someone who's terrestrial. That's the middle kingdom, terrestrial. And the kids would would be looked a little shocked, you know, like, well, shouldn't I try to find somebody celestial? And I'm like, well, good luck finding that person in your (laughs) 20s or 30s, 40s, 50s and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. That's the capstone. That's the culmination of a life lived valiantly. Don't expect to find it young. But if somebody has harnessed their natural man, you can have a great marriage. Of course, if we have the gospel of Jesus Christ, we would want to discuss celestial living with our partner before we get married and see if they're interested. And hopefully we can be equally yoked in our desire to continue forward in our progression to live celestial law. But Boy, if they're not even out of the telestial realm, you're going to have trouble and you're not going to be happy. Now, you can't change your partners, but you can be very careful about mate selection and, you know, don't be carried away by a pretty face. Look look to see if they can control their temper. Look to see if they pay their bills. If they get credit at the end of the semester with a decent grade, do they show up? Do they keep their promises? Do they do their ministering? 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like some of the non glorious tasks of life are really good indicators of good, solid terrestrial living. Mm -hmm. You're not getting an immediate reward, it's a delayed reward. And that's the law of the terrestrial is self control and delayed gratification. And even if it doesn't pay off immediately, I'm going to actually eat my vegetables before I have dessert. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to yeah. do my homework before I go out to play. I will pay my bills, even though I'd love to go get that new thing, but I'm going to wait and save up so that I don't, you know, yeah. irresponsibly handle my stuff. And so it, you can see it. You can see this when you're interacting with people. How do they treat the waiters and the waitresses? Mm -hmm. How do they treat people that don't have much to offer them? Are they willing to harness their natural man consistently? Do they fulfill their callings? Do they pay their tithing? Again, ministering is a good one, but are we are we willing to like make the sacrifices because the Lord's asked us to do it and we believe that there's a delayed reward? Yeah. There was a cartoon I saw years ago in a seminary office that said, uh, you know, when you work for the Lord, the pay may not be so great, but you can't beat the retirement. <laughs> <laughs> that's, right. that's really good. So, that's delayed gratification. <laughs> yep. What's what's the big difference jumping from terrestrial to celestial? Yeah. It's more subtle. The difference between terrestrial and celestial is inward more than yeah. outward. So it's not something again if we were, you know, looking to marry somebody celestial, you can't measure the heart. You can't measure yeah. really, you know, what exactly is going on inwardly, but you can notice behaviors and we should. Uh nevertheless, um let me mention too that the celestial is built on the terrestrial. Mm -hmm. You cannot skip from the telestial and all of a sudden, well, you know, I've been kind of playing fast and loose with the rules or the commandments or other people's feelings or my responsibilities, but now I want to be good. So I'm going to be celestial. Just watch, you know, you really have to cultivate that terrestrial realm and be, and I use this term all the time on my podcast, boringly consistent in your mm -hmm. obedience. Like, yeah. yeah, like God should be able to turn his back on you and know that you go about, you know, doing the things that that he has asked. And and our our partners should be able to see that. Our children should be able to see that. We don't have to be perfect, but we're working on it and we're we are boringly mm -hmm. consistent in our dependability and our responsibility. And then added to that, because we hunger and thirst after righteousness, and that's a key. We have to want more than just being good people. We want to conform to the image of Christ. We want to, to be born again. We want to have a constant companionship with the Holy Ghost. Now, the Holy Ghost and the Spirit can be with us when we're terrestrial because we've stopped offending it. At the telestial level, we're offending the, the Spirit all the yeah. time. Yeah. It doesn't We could be baptized. We could be confirmed. The Spirit's not going to be with us if we are telestial in our behaviors. But at the terrestrial, we can actually have the spirit be mm -hmm. unoffended. So it's much more present in our lives. But then we need to carry that consistency forward and ask for sanctification. So really, the difference is sanctification. At the celestial mm -hmm. level, we are not just behaving like Jesus Christ. Because if we can harness the natural man, we can behave like Jesus Christ at the terrestrial level. Right. But... The celestial level is a change of heart that comes from the baptism of fire that comes from the Holy Ghost. It where we become a new creature, where we like it said about the people of King Benjamin have no more desire to sin, but to do good continually. Like yeah. we don't have a desire for sin. And Nephi says this too in his psalm: make me show that so that I shake at the appearance of sin. Like that's celestial stuff. Like, we are yeah. so in sync with the spirit that sin. I mean, it offends us because yeah. we know it offends the spirit. And it doesn't mean that we're jerks or that we go around being a judgmental prick about people, but we yeah. do, we recognize it and we re, we feel it. We feel it like, no, this is evil. This is wrong. Yeah. And we we remove ourselves. Or if there's a stewardship involved as for a parent, for instance, we correct it. Love it. But it's internal. It's internal. You can't measure the heart, but God can. So he knows when our heart and mind are so set on the things of the spirit that we have truly hungered and thirsted. We have prayed for that sanctifying experience. And we want nothing more than to be fit for the kingdom. 
And I love how Lily, she, in this book, she goes more into depth and gives a ton of different examples of behaviors in each of those realms. But when I first read that chapter of talking about those differences in each of those realms and applying it to specific behaviors that I'm doing every day, both good and bad, it kind of helped answer the question that I've asked myself a lot, which is, if I died today, would I be worthy of celestial glory? Where would I, which of those three kingdoms would I fall into if I died today? And this book to me just, and it's not a, you know, set in stone, here's the laws. And as long as you do these five things, that, but it's a, it's a good indicator or measuring stick to self-assess and say, hmm, maybe I'm living terrestrially in this regard. My temper, for example, that's something that I've struggled with at times. And, and so it's helped me realize, oh, that's a, an area where I'm allowing the natural man to be in charge too often. Those are telestial behaviors that I can recognize in my daily life. And if I can elevate those to terrestrial behaviors, I can have the spirit with me more often, which then allows me to start becoming a celestial being. It starts to change. I can feel it. I can feel it changing my persona and my desires start to change. And, and so everything you say is, is what you said right here is spot on. But I just wanted to point that out that, you know, like when I'm, for example, teaching my children, my seven-year-old, the plan of salvation, that's one of the most common questions they, they give me is, well, dad, I'm scared I'm not going to make it to the celestial kingdom. I want to go to the sun kingdom, you know, and, and to be able to tell them, well, as long as we are trying our best to live God's commandments on a terrestrial level, be obedient, then we can have the spirit to guide us and help us become celestial. What a sweet question. Um, yeah. <laughs> but really important to reframe it. And that's mm -hmm. what you're doing because fear isn't the way. Yeah. Right. It's, it, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think that fear is actually a very um, heavenly motivator mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. to get us out of the telestial realm. Yeah. And that's why God lists penalties throughout mm -hmm. scriptures, you know. Yeah. And if you do this or if you persist in your sin, if you rebel, if you go to whatever, then, you know, yes, there awaits a time in hell for you to uh, <laughs> pay the price of the sins yeah. that you wouldn't allow Christ to cover for you. So fear is not a bad motivator to get us out of the telestial, but it's a terrible motivation past that yeah. because yeah. God grants unto men according to their desire, right? Alma 30, mm -hmm. oh, Alma 29, sorry. God granted unto men according to their desire. And that's that's so comforting that if we want it, the Lord will help us get there. And in fact, yeah. when I first thought about section 88, that verse 22 that I talked about that first sparked this thinking, I remember realizing that God is so kind and so generous, and he's not looking for ways to keep us out of the kingdom. He's always looking yeah. for ways to bring us in. So I don't think he would have I mean, and I, I trusted this immediately that like, if I actually do desire to be in the celestial kingdom, he will help me find the things that I need to do yeah. because yeah. he will honor that desire. So okay. he'll lead me to the things that I need to learn or correct. As long as my desire is true and not hypocritical or not just public yeah. so that I can pretend to impress my friends or, yeah. you know, ward members. No, if I, if I earnestly desire that the Lord will will honor that desire and bring me what I need. And and um, with our kids, we really want them to know that, that it's wonderful that you want that sun kingdom, mm -hmm. you know, and God will grant that desire to you. Yes, he expects us to learn, you know, the, the ropes and, and to grow and sacrifice appropriately. But that desire in you, in fact, if there was one prayer that I offered more than probably any other consistent prayer when I was rearing my children, it was, please let them have the desire for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Grant unto them that desire, because I know that God granted them to men according to their desires. If they want it, oh my goodness, that is huge. Yeah, And we want them to feel that confidence that God loves you for that desire. Yeah. And he, he will help you find that path. And the markers on the path. I love that too, because, um, well, I've at least had times in my life where I haven't desired, <laughs> you know, and, and other times when I have more and it is genuine. And then sometimes where I just don't feel it as much. And I'm just so grateful for repentance because 
really when we repent, we are given Christ's desires, you know, Christ-like desires. And it's, and so even if we don't feel that now or don't have that now, or maybe our children don't, like the repentance process allows that to grow, you know, inside it's of us. It's that mustard seed. It's yeah. the mustard seed story, right? You, totally. just, you just have a little, a little bit, a little yeah. bit. I can help it grow. Just plant yeah. it, you know? So that's, it that's was, so true. And the desire does ebb and flow. It can, yeah. it can really ebb and flow with all the circumstances of our lives. But I love your book because it, it helps to, like we teach the plan of salvation or we learn the plan of salvation. And these three kingdoms are some like far off destination that we will <laughs> eventually, you know, be be put into. And I think that the book has really helped bring it into today and into the present and into now for me, because it's like you always say you're choosing glory today, right? And every day you're making choices that are helping prepare you for that kingdom. And so that's also the beauty of this perspective is that it helps us think celestial, as President Nelson says, and brings it relevant into the now and into every moment. I really love what you said. And I and I um, will add to that, that I used to try to communicate this to my children. I said, you know, sometimes we have this idea that death confers virtue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I've learned a lot and I kind of want it, you know, so when I die, it'll all be good because then God will let me figure it out or whatever. And then yeah. our marriage will get better. And then our, you know, like I'll, I'll be able to deal with my bad habits or whatever. And it's like, no. And I used to point this out to my kids. I don't mean to be disrespectful in any way, but I, you know, so you go to a funeral and sometimes you're like, am I in the right place? Cause this person wasn't that nice. You know, yeah. <laughs> we, we talk about them like they're, they're perfect. And sometimes yeah. they weren't. And there were some right. pretty big, you know, tells and, and again, not to make try to make a final condemnation of anybody because that's a way above my pay grade. But we are asked to make intermediate judgments, yeah. and to, to have you know a sense of what's going on. And the most important application of that, of course, is looking in the mirror and doing that self evaluation that you mentioned, Parker. To you know look at ourselves and say you know what lack I yet, or what's mm-hmm. the next yeah. step. Um, I think it's important to my husband used to talk about this a lot. Um, just trying to help people again be kind of encouraged that. If we're terrestrial, if we are consistent about harnessing our natural man, and and that's serious, like we can't just ignore a bad temper or selfishness Mm -hmm. or that I cheat a little bit or I lie a little bit or I take advantage of my neighbor a little bit. I mean, now we're in second Nephi 28. I, you know, like that's not okay to just excuse those things. If I know about them, I should be addressing them. And if I'm working on that and I am trying to get more boringly consistent about being in a place where I don't offend others, I'm just not hurtful. And I, and I don't do self-destructive things. I don't have those addictions or those self-defeating patterns where I have secret sins or I, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's all that's required to make it into the millennium. Yeah. Yeah. The millennium is a terrestrial time. And, and when you think about how wonderful the terrestrial is, I think we sometimes kind of undersell it because it's not celestial. Don't get me wrong. You know, we can, we can reach for the sun and Christ can get us there. But but the terrestrial is wonderful. It's a wonderful yeah. place. And like I said, it's the stepping off foundation for anything, anything that we desire beyond that. Um, so, so if we can harness the natural man, we will not be destroyed at Christ's coming because we don't interrupt the spirit. We don't offend the spirit. We don't hurt people. Think about it. The energy during the millennium, we are told, is going to be so dramatically different. And this is not because mm-hmm. Christ waves a wand. It's because yeah. of the way people are. And yeah. if just having that terrestrial as the realm as the lowest common denominator will change the energy mm-hmm. so dramatically that lions will lie down with lambs. Yeah, yeah that's, that's terrestrial. Yeah. Like how remarkable. And so you go through how, you know, Adam and Eve initially lived in a terrestrial state. They partook of the fruit, they fell to a telestial state. And largely the world is, has been and is a, a telestial realm, except for a few exceptions like the city of Enoch that lived in a, a largely celestial state. And you point out that 
in more of the time you grew up in, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Hey, I'm not quite that old. Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> part of that era. Post-World <laughs> War II middle-class yeah. America. And it may have been in earlier realms too, or earlier uh, decades or, you know. Right. We, we kind of go through ebbs and flows. Yeah. And, it would, and I would limit it to like middle class, post-World War II middle class America, because um, different cultural classes often ha- yeah. do have more of a telestial lifestyle, different mm-hmm. cultures can. But yes, you're right. And it has sunk since then. It, it has deteriorated into, so I think parents, it's a great warning to parents and to partners that you got to swim upstream more vigorously yeah. than you might have had to do in those other decades because the whole world is coming at you the other direction. Satan yeah. is raging and he is glamorizing celestial law. Yeah. He is glamorizing the satisfaction of appetites, the unfettered yeah. natural man. Look at how we use that is a justification for adult whims to damage children. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like whatever I want, you know, I have to be justified in my needs, my desires, my truth, yeah. which is like, seriously. Anyway, but you're, you're absolutely right. It's much more difficult now than it was. If you, if you had good parents and you do the same stuff that your good parents did, it's not enough because the world has changed and your kids are being affected by things that you were not affected by growing up or invited to participate in or tempted to, Mm -hmm. to indulge in. So I know I jumped in there and there is something I'd like to also jump back. If you don't mind, I, I actually think it's an important point too to recognize that, look, I realize that we have relatively sketchy information about the next life. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot that has been revealed, but there's a lot that is not detailed or completely clear. But my understanding over the years of study indicates to me quite strongly that, and I think we can find all kinds of scriptural backup for this, that if you choose to live a telestial life in this life and and eat, drink, and be merry, like you said, party it up, Mm -hmm. you know, let your natural man be satisfied. We can go to hell and pay the price of our own sins. But all that does is balance the scales of the universe. It does not confer virtue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would we be fit for a celestial kingdom? In my opinion, if we have to go to hell, then the answer is no. Yeah. Yeah. We we may end up in a telestial kingdom, which is like, let's not underplay it. God is so incredibly generous. The telestial kingdom is magnificent. Yeah. But it's a pittance next to what he offers. Yeah. And there's not the eternal marriage bond available unless we seek the highest level of the celestial kingdom. So like, it's not like, oh, baptism for the dead will change the fact that I was rebellious because Right. rebellion is the problem and back to like when your your son is saying well i really hope that i don't blow it kind of you know i mm-hmm. really would like to have that kingdom of the sun bless his wonderful heart um that's not what that person is saying they don't have right. that desire they right. want to indulge their natural man and then pass go and collect 200 dollars. well on that note you talk in the book about counterfeits and you talk about how it, it sometimes we think we're being celestial but we're actually doing a counterfeit, a telestial version, Satan's version that mimics and looks really close to it. And we kind of, it's pretty easy to fall into that culturally in the church where we can look and appear like valiant celestial saints when in reality there's underneath some counterfeit thing going on. Talk a little bit about counterfeits and why it's important to look out for those in ourselves. Yeah, that's that's a, a really great principle. I'm glad you brought it up. Um Satan goes for the gold. He doesn't mimic the terrestrial. Why would he bother? But the (laughs) celestial, if he can deceive us by taking the form of the celestial, but changing the content from sacrifice to natural man, then sometimes he can be, you know, quite deceptive. Um, Some of the examples that are maybe the easiest to see, first of all, are like um, government and we just recently read through this with our curriculum in Book of Mormon, the change of government from kings to judges. Yeah. 
Yeah. And the, the whole speech that's given there is about this, where it's like, you know, if you can have a good king, that's actually best. And I remember as a young person reading that and going like, wait a minute, I thought democracy was the best. Yeah. I mean, you know, I growing up in America, I thought, isn't this the best form of government? And I remember Churchill's statement about, yeah, it's the best form of government, except for, or it's the worst form of government, except for all the other forms of government. <laughs> on the so, Churchill, you know, kind of was a little bit more uh, aware. And and why can democracy be a problem? Because when people become wicked, they vote for bad yeah. leaders or they stop voting mm -hmm. for good laws or good standards in our society. And we are living that. Mm -hmm. We are living it where the voice of the people wants abortion or the voice of the people yeah. want things that are, you know, are harmful. And that's that's a sad time. But yeah. It was safer to have the voice of the people, and it kept the sink the ship from sinking as fast as having a bad king. Because mm -hmm. look what happened with King Noah, and that's the example they use. You yeah. take this form of government, like if you got a prophet king, wow, it's a theocracy. Right. And the people are blessed. But all you need is one renegade son to take the throne and you've got King Noah and his wicked court and the people mourn and they end up in captivity and it's a disaster. Yeah. So there's such a rapid mm -hmm. change when you change the content, but the form is the same. Yeah. So yeah. when, when King Uzziah says the best form is a righteous King, I was like, really? Well, yes. Cause if you got a prophet King, you got a theocracy and that's yeah. basically yeah. what will happen in the millennium. Christ mm -hmm. will reign. Yeah. That's a, that's a monarchy, but the content will be pure. Otherwise, it's dangerous because all you do is change the person in the middle and you're in hell. Right. So the same thing is true with like people who they're deceiving themselves. And I'm again, I don't want to make a final judgment on anybody, but you can kind of see that like there are some people who like they want to go on a mission, but they don't really want to be converted or follow the rules or whatever, but they want to look good. So right. they follow the form. Maybe they got Christ on their screensaver, you know, and you're dating him and they sing hymns all the time, or they, you know, seem to wear their spirituality on their sleeves, but they've got an addiction or they, they have a terrible temper or they're selfish or they don't, you know, they, they exempt themselves from rules. Like they're the exception and they're always making these kind of exceptions and they have a form that looks so good. Um, I mean, I don't mean to diss people who are, I mean, missionaries can be wonderful, right? But I think everybody, I did not serve a full-time mission, but, you know, five of our kids did, all our sons and one daughter. My husband served a mission. So, and I've had a lot of clients who've talked about this, you know, they'll have like zone leaders or APs in their mission who are like, you know, so shiny. <laughs> and then six months after they're home, they're living with a girlfriend, you know? Yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. or they're on drugs again or whatever, you know, and you're like, and they're kind of people are like, what happened there? Well, that yeah. was a counterfeit. They wanted the form, they wanted the appearance of of uh, you know, having that resume item or checking a box or satisfying their parents' naggings or whatever, or or being able to say to, to a prospective spouse, I, I'm a right. return missionary because it, it looks good on the resume. But the content never really became better than two Eschel. They were satisfying their appetites by looking good. Mm -hmm. So we do need to look in the mirror sometimes and go like, what's motivating me? I mean, that was the Pharisees, yeah. right? Boy, their form was great. Right. <laughs> they were observant. Yeah. They prayed and they gave their alms in public, whatever, whatever. But what was the content? I mean, Christ really went after them because they were mm -hmm. hypocrites. Like you mm -hmm. sure look good in public. You guys won't even take care of your parents when in their aging years. Yeah. You won't even, you know, you don't even tell up the poor. You don't, you know, like you're snakes. But boy, you look good in public. <laughs> so we do need to be like, like just look yourself in the mirror and be honest and say, like, you know, I got these problems. I'm not gonna pretend. Now, I, it's not the same as like taking out an anthem paper or on social media and saying, I got all these sins. That's not required. But being honest with ourselves, with our spouses. Yeah. Or with a parent, if we're still at home with our parents or bishops, like for Pete's sake, tell the truth yeah. about what you're struggling with, where you are and what you need help yeah. with and deal with it. Christ is mighty to save. Yeah. You haven't invented a sin he can't fix. Christ's atonement is so incredibly generous that he's not even asking that much of us, but 
but he does ask it. He says, live according to the light you have. Yeah. And everybody has the light of Christ. And the light of Christ alone is enough for us to know not to hurt people and not to destroy ourselves. There yeah. are a lot of non-members out there who live really good lives yeah. because they are true to the light. And what does it tell us? Section 50 in the DNC, he that receiveth light and continueth in God receiveth more light and that light groweth mm -hmm. brighter and brighter to the perfect day. So there are some people out there who maybe haven't ever had an opportunity to understand or receive the gospel and certainly in times when the gospel wasn't on the earth, but they took that light of Christ and it grew because they were true mm -hmm. to it. And being true to it, you know, increased their level of understanding and all they need is the ordinances and they're yeah. at the head yeah. of the class. Yeah. So that's a whole different life from somebody who's like, eh. I mean, I hate to use Amulek. He's such a wonderful character, but he <laughs> does tell on himself. I knew but I would not know. Like, yeah. don't bother me with that. I'm having a party over here, you know? And yeah. I'm not saying, I mean, like, was celestial at that point. <laughs> it seems to me that he probably wasn't. But yeah. he wasn't concerned with enough of the things of the spirit when he gets that visit. And I think it was moving him from the terrestrial to the celestial, in my opinion. But that's the attitude that some people are like, well, I don't want to know because then I'm responsible. And you're like, yeah, you're already responsible. <laughs> Christ. And it can either yeah. grow or it can shrink because it's right. always moving. Like you're either growing in the light or you're retreating from it. So I guess the word that I want, I wanted always to talk, use with my children too, was to help them see that it's not imperfection that you know, disqualifies us. It's not being human. It's not mm -hmm. weakness. It's rebellion. Yeah. It's yeah, having an opportunity. Deliberately. And, yeah. You know, screw yeah. it. I'm not, I don't want it right now. It's too much work. I'd rather party. That's the problem. So your son has that desire. He's great. He yeah. just needs to keep growing and mm -hmm. the Lord will, will help him grow. But if we don't want it, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, I'm fine where I am, you know. Yeah, I love that distinction. And I think in the church, I hear this all the time in gospel doctrine classes and discussions where we kind of confuse the final judgment, the final destination and Christ's second coming. And we think that that's the final judgment when really that's just anyone who's rebellious, who's deliberately saying, I don't want any part of this. That's the cutoff. And it's anyone who's willing to at least live a terrestrial level that isn't burned at the second coming and is able to live in a terrestrial state. And then we have a thousand years to progress and to be changed into celestial beings. And so to decide we get, what we want, yeah, because it's it, really if we want it enough, you know, right. Yeah. And we get we we get caught up so much thinking that especially in the church, we, we do this too much where we judge, well, who's going to be the, in the celestial kingdom? And, and it's honestly, anyone who's just willing to, to obey and try their hardest, they're going to make it to that terrestrial reign, that millennial reign. And then they're going to have a thousand years to, to progress and to be changed. And, and ideally, and, and hopefully we are becoming celestial even right now before that, that second coming happens. Uh, but I think too often we can we... since we have gospel light yeah. and, and yeah. having the gospel light, honestly, there's, there's nothing stopping us from becoming Zion people right now. Mm -hmm. The temple ordinances, the priesthood yeah. on the earth, there's nothing stopping us. And if we inhibit that in ourselves, because we're a little too lazy or yeah. we want to party a little more, or we just think that I can do it later. That is a problem and not to yeah. be like terrified of it, but yeah, that should be a prompt that like, Hey, I'm rejecting it. That's rebellion. Mm -hmm. And I don't, God can't work with rebellion. He, it's our choice. So he won't force us. If yeah. we're not rebellious, he'll work with us. If we are, we take ourselves out. But yeah. And I remember a client saying once, because <laughs> I remember thinking, well, you know, maybe they won't need counselors in the in the yeah. millennium. I'll be a teacher because I love to teach. And uh, and this client said, no, actually, I think it's going to take a thousand years of family therapy for any of us to be for the kingdom. <laughs> Sounds about right. Yes. Okay, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Maybe there will be <laughs> some of us still. Anyway, the resources so, but, will be there. But the idea is that there's hope. And as long as we we have the right attitude and we are trying our best and we're not rebelling, we shouldn't be so fearful of this second coming. We should understand that, you know, we're going to have time to progress into those, that what you, you phrase as 
the celestial, what is a celestial being? Well, it's what Christ said, be ye therefore perfect. Like that's a daunting, be perfect. And I feel like sometimes in the church, we get stuck yeah. in this perfectionism loop and we think this is too hard, I'm quitting and we leave the church and we go try something easier. And letting members know that, no, God's plan is actually, you got a lot more time to progress to that be ye therefore perfect state. So hold on, keep being obedient, keep trying your best. And if you have the desires, you can get there. You know, President Nelson, when he was in the quorum, gave a speech in conference. I don't remember the title or the year. It probably wouldn't be hard to find that looked at some of the etymology of the word perfection and so on. And yeah. then, of course, went to the scriptures and said, even Christ himself does not refer to himself as perfect until after he was resurrected. Mm -hmm. So it was, like you said, in the final moment there of resurrection, that perfection is a gift that is granted to the faithful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yes, he believes in, in, in progress and he will nurture us along. I mean, I think we have to Sometimes we really don't give him credit for being as nice as he is, yeah. As, yeah. as kind and as merciful and loving as he is. And we see him as this fearful judge, you know, this, mm -hmm. this scary guy who's, again, looking for ways to expel us. That's not his nature. His nature is, you know, just give me something to work with and we can take this all the way. Yeah. But I need your I need you to decide you want it because I will not insist. I will not force. That's Satan's plan. Yeah. Satan's the guy who comes through with the brass band and wants us to feed our appetites and not be true to our potential. God is always like in the still small voice, right? <laughs> so so he's not going to demand our attention. But if we are interested, we start hearing him. As again, our prophet has encouraged us to focus on, and and he will lead us patiently along. Mm -hmm. Time's not the issue to God. He's not in a hurry. He just needs us to choose. Well, and he I'm not going to say he needs us to choose. He offers us this yeah. choice <laughs> and, and he invites us to choose. And if we do, oh, the mercy and the time will be available. 